or talent had predisposed her towards following a career as purely a concert pianist, a change of direction and a change of style were to lead to lasting fame and astonishing worldwide popularity for the girl born in Tuna Puna on the island of Trinidad, because it just happened that alongside her beloved classical repertoire, Winifred Atwell could also play like this. <laughs> Botsford's Black and White Rag, written in 1908, but a million seller for Winifred Atwell in the early 50s, and as far as she was concerned, the recording that set the ball well and truly rolling. So, Trinidad born, the daughter of a pharmacist who insisted that she should follow in his footsteps, and indeed it was Winifred's proud boast later that should her musical career founder, she could always open a chemist shop, she came to London via the United States, that pharmacy qualification already tucked beneath her belt, to see if she could, after all, make a life for herself in music. It was really shortage of cash, though, that encouraged her to branch away, as she thought temporarily, from those classical ambitions towards the popular styles in which she was to demonstrate such flair, and then things began to happen rather speedily. Called in as a last-minute replacement for a charity concert at the London Casino, signed up and subsequently groomed by Bernard Delfont, before emerging as the complete entertainer with a piano style that also allowed her to flourish as a composer. In fact, her next big hit in late 1952 was a piano rag she'd written herself. Britannia Rag. <laughs>
even if it Atwell's Britannia rag. It took Winnie a little while to get used to the world of popular music and variety. The story goes that at her first variety date at the Belfast Empire, she turned up without any music parts for the orchestra, whereupon the theatre's musical director said, but we're supposed to accompany you. Well, Winnie was a bit nonplussed and explained that she played everything from memory, but the MD was persistent. OK, said Winnie eventually, play anything you like and I'll follow you. Perhaps it was as well that she deferred to them in the matter of pace setting, because with a following wind, she took a bit of keeping up with. Winifred Atwell bringing the boogie-woogie piano style pioneered in the States in the late 20s and 30s by the likes of Pine Top Smith and Mead Lux Lewis to a mass post-war British audience. That was Cross Hands Boogie, which doubtless looked as impressive as it sounds, hands, elbows, everywhere. But it wasn't just the way Winifred Atwell played that caught the imagination. It was the instrument that she played upon as well, or at least one of them. They say everyone needs a gimmick, don't they? Well, Winnie found hers in a Battersea junk shop. It was a second-hand, knocked-about piano that had seen much better days. Price? Well, to you, madam, 50 shillings, two pounds ten in old money. Sold. Winifred Atwell's other piano, as it became known, provided just the tinkling, tinny barroom sound she was looking for and helped turn a fine piano player into an unlikely star. Thank you. 
Coronation Rag win his contribution to the Coronation celebrations in 1953. It would be misleading to suggest that she turned her back on the classical repertoire altogether. In fact, during the 50s, it was not at all unusual for a variety bill to include a straight music act where classically trained musicians would play abridged versions of concert favourites. The violinist Alfred Campoli, for one, and the celebrated piano duet team of Rabbits and Landar. So, although it was boogie and ragtime that first put Winnie in the limelight, once there, she found an audience for her classical skills too, and eventually those classical pieces that she included in her stage act, she was able to bring into the recording studio, the Greek concerto, the famous Litov scherzo, and most spectacularly, as far as record sales were concerned, the music of Sergei Rachmaninoff. Maninoff's 18th variation on a theme by Paganini, a top ten hit for Winifred Atwell in 1954. It's difficult to overestimate Winnie's popularity during her heyday. Total record sales that ran into tens of millions, her hands were insured for £40,000, and her fan club membership ran to some 50000 The happy-go-lucky, carefree style of her playing and the mood of party-time, hair-down optimism that it generated perhaps found its most authentic expression in the series of medley recordings whose titles specifically acknowledged that mood. Let's have a party, was the title of the first of them, and believe it or not, the follow-up, which provided her with the 1953 Christmas number one, was called Let's Have Another Party. Where would it end? The fact is that no informal social gathering in the mid-fifties was without a radiogram in the corner dispensing high spirits along these lines. <laughs>
Partying Winifred Atwell style. As her fame increased here, so did the offers from abroad. In fact, one Australian tour lasted 13 months, and her return home was reported in the British press with the craving for detail that only a royal marriage rift can create these days. Winnie returned home, said one report, to a wildly enthusiastic greeting from Nino, her white poodle, before striding directly to the kitchen to cook herself two boiled eggs. But throughout Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue, with Andre Kostelanitz conducting the orchestra. It was a piece she was later to record with Ted Heath and his music. Winifred Atwell with Ted Heath and his music, Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. Winnie's popularity in Australia was every bit as great as it was here in Britain, so when that British popularity began to wane, she decided in the 60s to settle in Australia, becoming an Australian citizen in 1981. And it was in Australia, just two years later, 1983, that Winifred Atwell died. There's an inescapable feeling, looking back, that the music that made others so happy in the 50s didn't necessarily do quite the same for her, 
that the potent mix of big smile, jovial personality, polished technique, party time recordings turned her almost by accident into a superstar, and although Winnie was content to be carried along by that success, the feeling lingers that while she played Boogie, she dreamt of Brahms. <laughs> Winifred Atwell's 1956 number one hit, Poor People of Paris. Well, that's it for this week. In a moment here on BBC Radio 2, you can hear Sing Something Simple. Ray Harvey produces Stars of the 50s. I'm Chris Stewart, and I'll be back next week to talk about the life story of a man who once declared in song that someday he would write the story of his life. That's Michael Holliday. Till then, bye-bye now. (laughs) 